Good evening. I'm Ron Collins, and on behalf of my co-chairs, Seth Berlin, Floyd Abrams, Lee Levine, Emeritus, and David Scover, welcome to the latest First Amendment Salon. The Salons began in 2014, and the purpose of the Salons was to engage the First Amendment community in important discussions about the law of freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of association, and freedom of petition and to do so in a civil and informed way. I'm pleased to say that tonight's topic and tonight's panelists continue in that fine tradition. I'd also like to ask you to mark your calendars for our next salon, which will be on um, Tuesday, July 13th, when Professor Robert Post will engage Professor Martha Minow to discuss her new book, which is titled Saving the News, why the Constitution calls for government action to preserve freedom of speech. Again, that's on July 13th, Tuesday. Before I turn things over to Seth, I want to give a shout out to an important new study co-authored by someone on our advisory board, namely Professor Sonia West. Professor West, along with Professor Ronell Anderson-Jones, has completed an impressive new study titled the United States Supreme Court's characterization of the press, an empirical study. You may have seen a recent write-up about it by Adam Liptak in the New York Times, and tomorrow First Amendment News will profile, it, profile that. With that, Seth, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Ron. Uh, let me welcome everyone uh, and echo Ron's welcome as well. Um, I'm going to do three things very quickly. One is I'm going to say a little bit about what's going to happen this evening. Two is I'm going to say a couple of things about the technology we're using. And three is I'm going to introduce our moderator. Uh, first, um, what we're going to do this evening is we'll, we'll have a panel discussion for about 50 minutes uh, to an hour. Uh, when that finishes, we will then move to questions and answers. I'll come back on the screen and say a little bit about how we do that. Um, there is a chat feature that you can use during the uh, session, which we will also use for questions, but the, the primary one will be a way of raising your hand, and we'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, most people at this point in pandemic are familiar with using technology like WebEx or Zoom, so I'm not going to say a lot about that. If you have any questions, um, you'll see a box on your screen for Lisa Cherisnowski, who is our host. She is the person at Ballard Spar who orchestrates uh, and, and makes the, all of this work seamlessly. Um, so if you have any technical questions, you can, uh, uh, you know, message her uh, directly in the uh, chat feature. Uh, if for some reason you get bounced off and you need help, uh, the other person that you can reach out to by email is Lisa Appel, who is uh, not on your screen, but is uh, part of our audience tonight. And she is the person who's behind the scenes, as you know, sends out the invitations and uh, keeps uh, track of who's going to attend. Uh, we could not do this without Lisa, without either of the Lisas, so thank you to them. Uh, but if you need to reach Lisa by email, uh, it is uh, appel, uh, L, so A double P E double L at ballardspar.com, uh, and she can hopefully help you get uh, reconnected if you're, if you're bounced out. Um, uh, lastly, I want to introduce our moderator. Uh, it's my true privilege to have Catherine Larson uh, join us as our moderator tonight. Um, she is the chief counsel for Reuters News at Thomson Reuters. Uh, she leads the global legal team for Reuters, supporting and defending journalists in nearly 200 locations as they produce and distribute multimedia news content in multiple languages across varied platform types. She counsels Reuters leadership on global news gathering and publication best practices and risks, including under criminal, national security, and privacy laws. In 2019, she helped secure the release of two Pulitzer Prize winning journalists who were falsely convicted on espionage charges in Myanmar after exposing a massacre of Rohingya villagers. Um, lastly, I will say that Catherine is a former colleague of mine and, a, and I know her to be both an outstanding lawyer and an outstanding person. So it is my true privilege and pleasure to welcome her. And now I'll turn it over to Catherine. Thank you, Seth. Well, hello to everyone and welcome to the intersection of privacy and the First Amendment. So specifically, tonight's discussion will center on the use of facial recognition technology and it's the permissibility of its regulation under the First Amendment. 
Setting our general framework uh, is the case of ACLU versus Clearview AI, filed last year and still in its early stages uh, in the state courts of, of Illinois. I understand um, that we're not even going to see likely um, ruling on a motion to dismiss until later in the year. So we're fortunate to have two terrific panelists with us tonight, both of whom have been directly involved in the case. We have Vera Edelman of the of plaintiff ACLU and Professor James um, Bambauer, who submitted an amicus brief on behalf of the defendant Clearview AI. So let me read their bios to you. Um, Vera Edelman is a staff attorney with the ACLU's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. She works on litigation and advocacy to protect freedom of expression and, and privacy rights in the digital age. She focuses on the right to protest, the free speech rights of young people, and genetic privacy. She argued for plaintiffs in ACLU versus Clearview AI. In the case, the ACLU is challenging, this is me, by the way, the ACLU is challenging the activities of Clearview AI under the Illinois um, Biometric Information Privacy Act, or BIPA. They're seeking declaratory and injunctive relief, including whether just, um, uh, the including the destruction of biometric identifiers collected and captured by Clearview AI in the absence of written consent. Uh, professor Jane Bam um, Bambauer is professor of law at the University of Arizona. Her research assesses the social costs and benefits of big data. She questions the wisdom of many well-intentioned privacy laws. Her article, Is Data Speech?, was published in the Stanford Law Review. And it argued that the regulation, any regulation that intentionally obstructs the creation of new knowledge should trigger free speech scrutiny. In an amicus brief in Clearview, I'm sorry, in the Clearview case, she argued that the Illinois BIPA is such a regulation and that it should not survive First Amendment review. So I'd like to kick off um, with Vera on the plaintiff side to talk to us about the case uh, and to let us know, you know, especially at the high level, what's at stake here? Thank you, Catherine, and thank you all so much for having me. Um, as mentioned, I am counsel in the case, so most likely, I, you know, we've talked about the questions ahead of time, I should be able to answer them, but know that there may be a point at which I plead lawyers reality at some point. Um, so the case, as Catherine mentioned, is a lawsuit that we brought on behalf of a number of organizations. So ourselves, the ACLU of Illinois, um, uh, various organizations that represent and work with sex workers, individuals who have experienced sexual assault, undocumented immigrants, and others who regularly seek to exercise their constitutional rights to protest, to speak out, to seek sensitive medical care. And we filed the lawsuit um, to challenge Clearview's non-consensual capture of those organizations' members' face prints, biometric identifiers. We did not challenge the um, amassing of public information from across the internet, nor are we arguing that Clearview can't express an opinion about who appears to be in a photograph. We're really focusing our challenge on that non-consensual capture, which is prohibited by BIPA. Um, and we are viewing this as a important case for, as Catherine articulated, um, protecting people's free speech and privacy rights. So we are interested in um, arguing that BIPA survives constitutional scrutiny as applied to Clearview, that other states can pass comparable laws, and that we can have privacy and free speech too. And I should also say this is a very funny posture for me personally because I consider myself a free speech attorney. I work for the ACLU Speech and Privacy Project. And so I definitely take the First Amendment objections here seriously and I'm excited to have this conversation with everyone. Good. And Jane, could you talk from your perspective on, and I think I said this out loud, that your, your amicus brief was filed on behalf of yourself, but also the Duke um, clinic, the legal clinic. From that perspective, so you and the clinic, what's your view on what's at stake in this case? Yeah, well, the, the main thing that's at stake is figuring out what the appropriate interaction between privacy rights and free speech and specifically knowledge should be. So the BIPA intentionally interferes with creating information that can readily produce knowledge. Uh, for the very purpose of disrupting 
that knowledge creation. And by the way, to be clear, every privacy law does that. So th that fact alone is not, in my opinion, you know, it's not a death sentence or it does not doom um, this particular privacy law on free speech grounds per se. Um, and just as we have good reason to regulate state secrets and intellectual property, sometimes there are good reasons to make well-tailored regulations of, of sensitive personal information as well, of course. Uh, but the BIPA does not uh, the BIPA goes well beyond what a well-crafted privacy law does because it actually creates a property entitlement. You know, even as Vera said, we're talking about whether someone has consented or not to the creation of a face map. Um, and that's really quite a broad category of information. You know, one thing I find troubling about the, the, the even the terminology in, in the Illinois law is that biometric identifier sounds like something quite narrow and um, and highly sensitive. It sounds like we're talking about um, fingerprints or um, you know DNA or something that isn't readily uh, viewed and used every day by uh, you know by by in, in ordinary course of life. Um, here, though, as this case makes clear, we're talking about an entitlement that um, gives people a right uh, to, to stop companies and individuals from doing the sorts of things that we do with our brain all the time, but just doing it in an automated way, uh, automatic, automated way with the help of technology. Um, so, you know, we're allowed to look at a photograph and recognize who that is. And when we do that, our, you know, our wet computer seems to be doing roughly what AI's computers are doing in software. We create a sort of, you know, a, a map of, of the key features of a face, and then we run it through basically our Rolodex of, you know, our library of faces that we have in our memory. That's what, uh, that's what um, Clearview does, and it's the creation of that map uh, that uh, requires consent under the Illinois law. So there's some other, you know, pieces of this case that I think have an, a, a particular ick factor. You know, the fact that it's not just the government, but especially police departments that tend to be the clients. Um, and the fact that we are discussing a topic in the context of, of corporate speech, you know, a, a company that's that's trying to create the software. But uh, and we can talk about that if you want. But for me, the main issue is this. Um, question of whether a law that means to disrupt, purposefully disrupts um, knowledge, uh, should have to undergo strict, or, you know, quite quite exacting scrutiny. So you just raised this, and I think we should jump right into it because I noticed in the briefing a lot of it is about what exactly is Clearview AI doing. So Vera, could you describe in in your you know in your words what Clearview AI is doing? Um, and contrast that perhaps with what Clearview, how Clearview might might describe it. I can certainly try, but I can also say we haven't gotten to discovery yet, so there might be things I sure, certainly sure. don't know. Um, but my understanding, and I think it's interesting, Jane is basically, or Professor Bambauer is saying, you know, face map, and I am using face print, and I think the language in BIPA is scan of facial geometry, and I think there's some interesting sort of space between all of those things. My understanding essentially is that what Clearview does is it gathers photographs from across the internet and then it captures face prints. It creates unique biometric identifiers for, for every image that it takes from the internet. First it does it, um, creates basically a template image that defines what the identifier is and then with future probe images, basically images that are used to I say, who who is this? Um, it then creates, again, a biometric identifier and matches those things. And to me, I think I do put this in the category of fingerprints or DNA, face print, fingerprint, both are really scans of body geometry. And we may think of fingerprints as things that are perhaps easier to define, something that we've thought about more often, something that we 
just have a stronger gut reaction to, perhaps because face prints are a newer technology. But the reality is that fingerprints too, we rely on heuristics. We think about loops and whorls that are more likely to be helpful in analyzing who this fingerprint belongs to, and then rely on that print to uniquely identify a person based on their immutable biology. Exactly the same thing is happening with face prints. There's a scanning of facial geometry of sort of common distances or angles on a person's face that is, you know, according to Clearview, unique to that individual. That's in some ways the crux of its business model. And so to me, what's happening is that Clearview is capturing a unique biometric identifier from people's images, something that is not uh, I just almost it is not available on the face of the photo. I'm sorry for that pun. It was not intentional, but I heard it before I said it. Um, there is a difference between a photograph. There's a difference between me here right now on video with you all and my biometric identifier, my face print that could be extracted um, with sufficient analysis. And I'm. It, it's not necessarily even the case that it has to be a computer that is doing it with fingerprints, human eyes, human analysts are the ones who often do the fingerprint analysis, but it still leads to and is reflective of unique biometric information. And then they, and so after using the face print, Clearview essentially um, identifies images of the same individual from across the internet, across time, across locations, relying on that biometric identifier that it has captured without consent. So Jane, can you speak to that, the difference between face print, face map, or, you know, the other terms, you know, where, well, think, how do you view that? I think we can use, for, for the purposes of this conversation, we can use them interchangeably, but, but I, I would agree with Vera that fingerprints and face prints should be basically treated the same way, either on one side of protection or the other, um, if the facts were different. If we all went up to each other every day, and looked at each other's fingers in order to recognize each other. And we looked at each other's fingerprints and we were like, oh yeah, okay, that's, oh good, that's my husband. I can, I know who he is now. Then, then there'd be some, you know, comparison here to be made, but that's not what happened. So, so if, you know, I, I, I disagree with Vera, you know, I think descriptively we mostly agree on this case, but I disagree that the, um, that the uh, automation or, you know, machine, uh, part of, of of this is irrelevant. It it has to be relevant because if it's not relevant, then we're all violating BIPA every day when we look at each other's faces, and we store in our own you know in our own memories approximately what what a face looks like. Um, so you know so the reason I think that the Biometric Privacy Act makes sense when it's protecting things like fingerprints is that for the most part we don't have um, we don't have in 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 the public domain a lot of information about the precise uh, lines on each other's fingerprints and therefore that information can be used to authenticate people to get into their phones or into their bank accounts or whatnot because as a practical matter it is private and has been private for a long time that's just not true for our faces and the facial geometry that we carry around in public all the time and Vera, what's your view on, on this being about the automation as opposed to the human comparison? So just two things, I think two things that Jane just said are really interesting. So one is just so people know, there actually is technology that now purports to scan your fingerprint from images of hands. So I think the reality is that the same arguments really do apply. If we think it's problematic for a uh, company to capture our fingerprints from images of our hands, which arguably, in exactly the way that Clearview argues here, we are exposing to the public. It, I don't understand how we draw a line between those two things. Once we're carrying something on our bodies in public, if the argument is that anything from our bodies can be taken um, without either, uh, and has to then be subject to, you know, the highest First Amendment scrutiny, I think it has to apply to fingerprints as well. And I think also the point about how our fingerprints are used to secure private devices, our face prints are too. I will admit that I do not use my face print, but I had to borrow my partner's computer last week after I spilled coffee on mine. And I, you know, was barred initially when my face did not mass match it. So I think the reality is that we do actually use these biometric identifiers as um, 
things that are meant to gate access to secure areas. And they also are things that, sure, we might know the face of our close friends, but once you are talking about being able to track people across the internet, across time, across locations by using a unique biometric identifier, I think the privacy harms just feel pretty different. Um, and on the technology point, I think it's an interesting question that kind of goes to what exactly a face print is. I think there might be disagreement on this. And my own view is that it doesn't have to be technology. The thing that's distinct isn't, isn't that we can recognize a person by looking at an image of them. I don't think a map is the same thing as a print. I don't think a portrait is the same thing as a face print. But I do think that there's a point at which you create a unique biometric identifier. And I think that's kind of the premise of Clearview's whole business. Oh, okay. So I think I understand, uh, just for clarity, I, I think we might be answering slightly different questions because I would say that, yes, a law that prohibits the creation of a fingerprint or the creation of, or say, a genetic sequencing, that too is a prohibition on the creation of knowledge and would have to undergo free speech scrutiny. So that 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 might be where we we differ that I think they all would have to go and undergo free speech scrutiny and may, and and you presumably do not. However, under that scrutiny, it is much much harder to defend a law that gives people a right to to completely control the stuff that everyone sees every day and makes use of all the time as opposed to a fingerprint and other stuff that is used really only, you know, both historically and practically today, that is used only for authentication purposes or for, um, for, for, you know, that is not as visible as a human face. That's helpful. And I actually, sorry, Catherine, to jump in, but no, I just want good. to make clear that we don't think that no, so we don't contest the idea that First Amendment scrutiny should apply here. And we actually argue that intermediate scrutiny should apply and is satisfied under United States versus O'Brien. So I think the other thing that's interesting about our positions here is I really think there's very little daylight, actually. We don't argue that no First Amendment scrutiny should apply. In fact, we also argue that some version of heightened intermediate, in our case, under O'Brien scrutiny should apply. So maybe our main disagreement is really just whether or not that scrutiny is satisfied. Yes, well, so then why don't we why don't we jump into that now? We can come back to some of these points about what exactly the activity is as we talk about why you know, it, it's the intermediate scrutiny test that, that you argue applies as opposed to um, Jane arguing it's a strict scrutiny test. So Mary, do you want to start and talk about why and you view this as conduct um, meriting, you know, First Amendment scrutiny, but at the intermediate, at the O'Brien level. Sure, thank you. Um, so we view this as conduct akin to trespassing or wiretapping. Courts, the Seventh Circuit, for example, has also said that BIPA non-consensual capturing of biometric identifiers is akin, essentially, to the act of trespass, and we think, again, that it's very similar to the act of extracting a fingerprint from an image online or even from collecting latent fingerprints out in the world. Similarly, from gathering, you know, public pieces of information, let's call it a newspaper, something that someone has, a Kleenex someone has thrown out, and extracting DNA from that publicly exposed material. Um, I think the same would be true if there were a way to, for example, zoom in on images of people's homes or um, apartment buildings and extract the key, uh, the, the way that basically all of the information about the key such that you would have a digital key to access that person's home. To me, all of those things are conduct. They really are acts, and sure, they could be part of the flow of a knowledge stream in the same way that wiretapping or even trespass, if you know that X house has information you really want and is really newsworthy, um, could impact the flow of information and could bar access to information that we all might want the public to have. But I think there's a difference between 
um, things that have been publicly exposed and things that remain private. I think the other interesting piece about this case is it brings up the idea that there may be layers of privacy or layers of information contained in even one image. The idea that there is something private that can still be extracted from an image that has otherwise been exposed to the public. But I think that's also something that's pretty consistent with the way that the Supreme Court has thought about biological material specifically in the Fourth Amendment context. The idea that once the government has our blood or urine or even DNA, the fact of it having that biologic material biological material doesn't mean that there's not a separate Fourth Amendment event when the government then seeks to extract additional information to test it for pregnancy, genetic disorders, etc. Um, so in both of those ways, I think this is conduct that perhaps in certain instances can disrupt the flow of information by um, if regulated, um, but it is conduct that seeks to extract sensitive non-public information. Um, and it's also, I think, the fact that it is conduct is shown by a lot of the other use cases of BIPA, in which people, uh, companies use face prints and fingerprints to, for example, gate access to an amusement park for workers to clock in and out, et cetera. All of those, to me, ring as conduct. Okay, here too, I think there's a big gap in how we would describe this case. Uh, this is definitely not conduct and none, none of the applications of BIPA would be. And, and to take various two um, analogies to trespassing and wiretapping, those two are very different. Trespassing is conduct and it is regulated for reasons that have nothing to do with information flows. It does interfere with information flows, uh, but that that has but that isn't the reason that we have uh, trespass laws. Wiretapping, by contrast, is illegal precisely in order to interfere with information flows. Um, and because of that, uh, because of that, wiretapping laws uh, need to be well constrained to contexts where people have legitimate expectations and interests in privacy. And we are seeing the First Amendment actually interfere with some of the wiretapping laws for in states, you know, in states that um, in states that prohibit even parties to the actual conversation from recording, um, from recording or videotaping or what not, whatever is happening. Right, Th those cases are challenging wiretapping laws with the understanding not that these are incidental. Uh, burdens on information, but rather that um, wiretapping laws are direct interferences with information flows and with speech, with expressive activities, and that only some of them can survive scrutiny. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I, I think that's the way, but we are, we are in somewhat murky terrain, which is why we're having this conversation and why the case is so important and why we're all here to talk about it. But for, for me, it's quite important to get the First Amendment to cover these things fully, directly, not incidentally, uh, for a couple reasons. One is, um, you know, the reason BIPA exists is in order to intentionally reach the type of information exchange that the, uh, that, that the regulators um, feared. And so... We can look at the end point where Clearview is telling the police who they think someone is and see that as a pretty classic speaker and willing listener that, um, that, that the regulators are trying to um, prevent from having the conversation that they're having. But maybe you know, a better explanation and one that I think is more persuasive and, and you know, fits better with sort of my vision of what the First Amendment really is meant to do um, is much more direct than that. It's not just that these face maps or this, you know, raw data, it's not just that they are critical infrastructure in order to have the types of conversations that Clearview is having with its clients. It's that the creation of the data is itself should be directly protected, just like how video recording something that's happening in public uh, or anywhere, video recording period, uh, should be fully protected. And then we should be asking whether a regulation that interferes with it can survive scrutiny. The one thing I found interesting is that, um, and since Clearview doesn't have a representative here, 
they say that they're republishing photographs and running a search engine expressing an opinion about who is in the photo. So this is yet another way to describe the activity that they're undertaking. Do either of you have a, a comment on, on their version, the search engine description of their activity? I actually suspect Vera and I might agree on this one that I understand why strategically they're focusing on that. Then, it, then this case comfortably can, can be you know, fall within um, ACLU versus Reno or other, you know, sort of protections of, of internet speech and whatnot. Um, but, you know, maybe because I am a scholar or something, I'm more interested in the slightly harder and, and probably more accurate description of the case, which is the one that the ACLU focuses on, the creation of these of these face maps, regardless of what ultimately happens to them. Vera, do you agree? I think that's right. I mean, I also think it's just not necessarily different from what we're saying. I think essentially what I would say is, okay, sure, you run a search engine, but by capturing people's biometric identifiers without consent in order to then express an opinion, which is, by the way, in part why we understand that there is an incidental effect on speech as applied to Clearview, and so argue for at least, you know, argue that O'Brien applies and is satisfied here. And Vera, what's your response to Jane's formulation of this um, as impeding, you know, the flow of information, a willing speaker, a willing listener, you know, how do you, how do you respond further to that when you're, when you're saying, no, this is truly just conduct? Again, I just think that it's too categorical to say that anything that interrupts the flow of information is necessarily speech. I, to, I think that the fact, you know, wiretapping is an interesting example. I think it is the most similar, as Jane is saying, because I think it is about information. But I don't think, notwithstanding Sorrell, that information is necessarily 100% always speech in the same way that perhaps this will be controversial. I don't think words are always speech. You might use words to engage in securities fraud or identity theft or any number of other things. And so I think that there is it, it's too simple almost to say that anything that's dealing with information or interrupting the flow of information is necessarily speech. I also think it's interesting to think about where our two arguments get us. I think looking at Jane's amicus brief and at our argument um, in the party briefs, most of the cases that we're relying on apply intermediate scrutiny. And, you know, Bartnicki and Brandsburg, both of them I think one of the lessons that they teach is that not all information is public, not all things that interrupt the flow of information are impossible for the government to regulate or necessarily subject to strict scrutiny. The other piece of the puzzle may be content neutrality. And so I think that that's the other, even if you were to say this is a regulation of speech, which again, I don't think is the correct analysis here, the way to bump to strict scrutiny, which is my is Clearview's position, but not necessarily Jane's, is to then add in content based to the mix. Jane? Um, so my formulation was not that any regulation that interferes with information or interrupts information flow. Uh, counts as expressive activity that gets direct, you know, directly protected by the First Amendment. But I, I do, and, and here, you know, I'm borrowing from Justice Kagan, I, I do think that purposeful interruption is one way to automatically get into the scope. So if the whole point of the regulation is to disrupt the information flow, that's good enough. There may be other things that fall into the scope as well, but when the government is trying to interfere with, with information, I mean, here, I think we just disagree, right, Evil? <laughs> but um, uh, the, if, if the government's trying to interfere with, with information flows, that, that, that should be enough. And, and the case actually that I think is um, most interesting to read in light of where we are right now is the NAACP versus Clyborne case. Uh, if you haven't read it recently, I recommend like rereading it because it's weirdly, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it weirdly covers a lot of terrain that we're dealing with right now. It, 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 it involves, it's a case involving a um, boycott of white owned businesses when a, uh, when a local government in Mississippi refused to basically defund its police. <laughs> um, 
And what the NAACP did, you know, among other things uh, that, that got them enjoined was they set up these store watchers, so these people that would just sit in front, uh, you know, stand in front of the white owned businesses and see which of their own community members, their, their own, you know, black community members were violating the terms of the boycott so that they can, so that they could later be shamed through, um, through um, at the NAACP meeting and in their publication and whatnot. And the court found that those store watchers who were just there to watch who was coming in and out of the building, that that couldn't be enjoined either. And so that was sort of an information gathering part of the process that was part of the total package of stuff that was directly uh, protected by the First Amendment, according to the court. That's fascinating. We rely on Claiborne quite a lot, and I have not actually looked at that particular piece, but that's, it's, I, I feel like my whole practice could just be litigated under Claiborne. Um, and I think the one thing that I, sorry, Jane, I, fair point that I perhaps overstated what your position is. I think the other thing that I thought of when you were talking, but forgot to say when I was talking, is, so you were basically saying wiretapping we can think of that as a regulation of information, but perhaps, I, and I wonder if you would say that those laws can be subject to intermediate or strict scrutiny, but if we think they can be subject to intermediate scrutiny, one of the things that is necessary even there is that they are only limited to reasonably private conversations. And I think perhaps, again, where we might differ is I take that point, and I, to me, a face print is always reasonably private, but I think this just goes back to our general disagreement about precisely what it is and what the difference is between another human just looking at a friend or a colleague and knowing who they are versus the creation of this biometric identifier to identify them. And, and one question that I had when I was reading through the briefing in this case is, you know, no one's really focused on how the images that are that are being used by Clearview um, came to be publicly available. So when I was thinking about the reasonable expectation of privacy here, I was thinking about how there are many ways I can, you know, put my photo up as, you know, my profile photo on Facebook and Twitter. But I realized that I oftentimes maybe post myself with my partner or, you know, I could post one of my kids or this and that. So I was thinking about, you know, the different reasons people's photographs appear online. And you know, in, in ways that where they aren't posting them, and so there was in the in the briefing there was a lot of discussion about um, information being voluntarily contributed to the public domain, and I thought it was surprising that there wasn't more focus on that in the in the briefing. Do you find that to be not legally relevant? That you know, so once something's you know publicly available, um, is you know, is that the end, or is you know? Should Clearview or should any of this analysis turn on whether you know I'm as the subject of a photograph, I'm the one posting it as opposed to posting a photograph of a third party who might not even know that it was being posted? I can so okay. I think again this might be one where we actually agree, which is that I think that the distribute once something is publicly available, there are perhaps differences in the way that we would think about the privacy interest. And I also think that First Amendment interests are much more implicated. This is something that is not squarely presented by our case in part because we didn't challenge the amassing of images across the internet. And that's partially a recognition, again, as you know, litigators for the ACLU, that there actually are important free speech um, implications and interests in collecting publicly available information, analyzing it, et cetera. I think in many other worlds and in many other cases, I would actually completely agree with Jane. I just think in this particular application, I just see a difference between general analysis um, and the creation of a biometric or extraction rather, not the creation of a biometric identifier. Jane, is that right? Uh, well, probably, but that just, it, it, I just don't understand the principle on which, um, whether we call it creation or extraction, wh why this type of analysis of a publicly available photograph should be treated so differently. I, I think, I mean, to, to make me seem, you know, I'm not a complete uh, nutter when it comes to privacy law. I understand we need to be thinking about um, what types of seclusion are really important to have, regardless of context. You know, what 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 types of space do we need in order to make sure that the consequences, social, economic, and otherwise, 
of our decisions are not too great. And, uh, and you know, crafting, um, crafting privacy rules around something that provides us at least a minimum amount of, of, of seclusion seem very important to me. But this is not the way to do it. This is actually very, um, you know, the, the BIPA is, is quite, um, it, it's com completely context neutral in a bad way. So, you know, so you might not like facial recognition, um, or at least in most contexts, you might not like facial recognition when it's used by the police, but does that mean that we shouldn't let Shutterfly organize our photographs for us? Um, does that mean that we shouldn't, we should never have an app that can help us uh, re recall a person's name, you know, for, to help us be slightly less socially awkward at a party? I mean, that just the, the possible uses of facial recognition are so vast that we really have the default wrong here. The default should be, um, okay, we, it's, it's always hard to predict what types of information and what types of analyses are going to be most valuable to most people. So let's have let the First Amendment dictate that the default presumption is, is we can try th new things out um, with information driven products and services until until we've figured out how to define a problem and 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 create a narrow, narrowly tailored uh, rule around around just that problem. Okay, let's come back to the analysis and the um... Jane, can you talk more about your position uh, in your briefing that this is a content-based regulation of speech? Going back to what Vera flagged up about that difference in your approaches. Yeah, and you know, here, to be honest, for a while, I really struggled with whether content-based versus content-neutral, whether that line should really be as important as it is in, in free speech precedent, because it's sort of, there's this irony that in order to be well-tailored, you sometimes have to describe the type of speech that's bad and harmful. And then in that description, you wind up having a content-based regulation. And so it, in you know, and so, so uh, legislators get kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. But the more I have taught those cases, the more I realize that that might be kind of the point that um, that if you're if you're going to be content neutral, then we at least have some you know if, if the law is going to be content neutral, we at least have some assurance that it's going to be even handed and that it's not going to be the sort of thing where um, you know only your ox gets gored and not the other person's. Um, but um, but at the same time, if it's going to be content neutral, it is actually going to be harder to tailor a law even to the inner the standards of inter intermediate scrutiny precisely because it's so neutral. Um, and so this is sort of a high level uh, explanation of why I think the content neutral versus uh, content uh, based divide uh, makes some sense. Um, so if we run with that, then this Illinois BIPA, I mean, it's quite clearly content based, right? So um, it's not all information that that is banned from being created. It's only a certain type of information, information that describes people, information that describes people's faces. Or the, um, and uh, and that's a, you know, a sort of, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a little bit of a uh, of an absurd distinction because again, I've been saying this whole time we need narrowly crafted laws, and so of course the narrow tailoring. Like if 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 we were talk to talk about a protection of DNA information, for example, that that banned the non consensual um, uh, sequencing of somebody else's DNA, that too would be content based and would have to survive strict scrutiny. I'm just quite confident that it would, um, and that this shouldn't. And Vera, would you like to respond to that and talk about your view on the content neutrality aspect? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of what Jane said, actually, I don't disagree with. And I think is interesting this idea that because basically I think what it collapses into is that every privacy law would have to be subject to strict scrutiny because other or it would be overbroad. So either it would be based Not wiretap on, laws that, that wiretap laws might be a good counterexample. So but... what is that in your mind? Because they are not based on the content of the information that might be collected. It's based on the context of the conversation. 
But if the part of your reasoning is basically this, this conversation needs to be sufficiently private. So then isn't it, you know, targeting private information and in that way, arguably content based? Only in the same way that saying um, loud stuff needs to be, you know, loud music needs to be below a certain decibel level. Like if that's not content based, then I don't think this is either. And there is, I think there's some Clear of you argues with that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, I was interrupting you. Please continue. No, I think I was interrupting you first, but <laughs> I get that there's a little bit of slippage there um, and that there might be some interesting line drawing problems, but I don't think that this one is hard since the type of data that can or cannot be created is based on what the data is, what the, what the data says. I think the slippage is important just because I think basically by the argument that everything, you know, O'Brien itself was about burning draft cards. Is it content based because it wasn't about burning playing cards? I think in your amicus brief, you say BIPA is content based because it's about human faces, not cat faces. But I, I think those, you just kind of get to a level of absurdity when you're trying to make these distinctions. And I think read notwithstanding, I think in part what we content based is meant to look at, and I think O'Brien actually retains this language and is a, um, this remains, you know, important is basically that the law shouldn't be aimed at the suppression of a message. Here, it's not that BIPA applies if you say that X photo is of Vera or Jane or not of Vera or Jane. It applies regardless of whether you actually say anything at all. So Clearview, back to your point about the search engine analogy, you know, our position is that Clearview violates BIPA at the moment that it non-consensually captures the face print, not at the moment that it expresses a message based on the use of that face print. And so I don't actually think that the government's interest here is in stopping a particular message. It's in retaining and protecting people's expectation of privacy in their biometric information and also in protecting their real and expected security and not allowing the non-consensual capture of um, essentially a key that is used to access and identify them in any number of ways. And I think the other thing that I just wanted to note is that BIPA requires notice and consent. It isn't a full prohibition. So it's not as though Shutterfly couldn't use our face prints to identify us across images. What it has to do is just ask its users, are you cool with us extracting this biometric identifier from you and use it in these precise ways. And I think that's actually, you know, to your point of we should see what problems arise and then tailor a narrow solution to them. I think that's what happened. Face printing isn't really as new as we might think it is when we compare it to fingerprinting. In reality, it's been around for several decades and we've seen the harms from it. We've seen the false arrests from it. We've seen the sur the pervasive surveillance and tracking from it. We've seen um, some security harms from it. And so I think that the view that the problem here is that people don't know and lose control over their biometric identifiers. And to me, the perfect solution seems to be to give them back that knowledge and that control. So, um, so first of all, and I don't think O'Brien's a good case because that is that I would just, I mean, I, I consider that a conduct case. And so this just takes us back to the initial disagreement we had about whether it's speech or conduct in the first place. But, um, but on, on, on BIPA, um, on BIPA, I also don't think that saying that you can do it as long as you have consent is sufficient. I mean, so first of all, it's definitely a burden. I think we agree, would agree on that. It's a burden on if it's gonna, if it's speech, then it's a definitely burdened. Um, and then as a practical matter, there's just no way Shutterfly can actually get the consent of people who are not even users of their service, but whose images are on, you know, uploaded to, to Shutterfly. And so I, I think it's in this case a prohib, you know, a prohibitively expensive burden. Um, but 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 one of the interesting things about Illinois is that I, I don't think I, I think the legislature actually had um, an alliance of interests that are really distinct and that I think are worth teasing out. 
Uh, if you read the purposes of, of BIPA in the, you know, in, in, in the initial language, um, in the, uh, yeah, uh, the purposes, the first like five or six purposes all listed are all data security purposes. So this is like basically using biometric identifiers as passwords, which, which Bear and I have talked about a little bit. There, I have no problem. If the law was just restricted to that, it would be kind of like the CFAA for biometric identifiers. This is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the you know, anti-hacking rule. Anti-hacking rules, uh, again, I think would easily survive um, scrutiny because they are quite narrow. Um, but the other purpose of BIPA is this more, much more general privacy interest that even when we're just talking, even when we're not using a face print or any other type of print, for authenticating um, access to an account, even when it's clearly in the case of facial recognition, just being used to you know, facilitate identifying people um, or any other you know, unknown purposes that we haven't developed yet, um, there, uh, that, that, that's a much more expansive purpose. It gives people a right to control things, not because they might be impersonated and someone else might break into their accounts, but just because they don't want people to know something about them. And that, that really is when we start shifting from data security to the kind of Eugene Volokh version of privacy, where it's a, it's a right for you to not be able to speak or know things about me. Uh, and so that is, that, that's big. And, and I see, you know, the cases I'm concerned about are the ones like Shutterfly and Clearview um, that really are not, no one even pretends that they are about um, secure access to bank accounts. Good. Well, let me get it as we're getting to the top of the hour, pivot one more time and, and kind of ask the bigger picture question about the kind of world that, that we want to live in. And I thought it was interesting to see that Canada's regulator has already found Clearview's activities unlawful, absent consent. So um, requiring consent for the capture of these face prints. Um, and, you know, my hot take would be that the GDPR um, and its various forms in domestic implementing legislation across Europe would take a similar view requiring consent. What, you know, what is your view on the, on where the United States is globally um, in terms of allowing this in our really, you know, just a very strong First Amendment? And what do you think it says about, and I think Jane, you were talking about, you know, letting this play out. Is that, you know, is, is, is that the, um, uh, you know, the approach of the United States, or is there something more that we should be talking about, about why we're choosing to be, you know, one of the extremes here in terms of protection of exchange of information and data? I, can, I mean, I think generally, as a general matter, I love that we protect free speech here and that this is a more speech um, forward country than the rest of the world. I think it has huge benefits. I think the world I want to live in is one in which the First Amendment continues to protect speech at, in the way that we all think it should and, in fact, does, and that laws like BIPA can satisfy First Amendment scrutiny. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, th you know, we, we are definitely an outlier. Um, we, but, but, by the way, one, one, another thing that really makes this case easy to, um, you know, it, it, it's at risk, I think, of muddying the waters because we're talking about the police as the primary clients. And I, I did want to say that if, if Illinois had a law that prohibited police departments from using facial recognition, there would be no First Amendment debate here. We'd have, you know, we that might be bad policy, but but we wouldn't be talking about the sort of bleeding edge of, of free speech, um, of free speech coverage here. Um, but so when it comes to privacy vis-a-vis -vis each other, not the government, but but one another, and including um, with respect to private companies, the U.S. is really different. And I think that's good, you know, broadly speaking, you know, we're sort of ignoring all the nuance for a second. Uh, the US and Europe used to have a, a situation where basically, you know, elites had privacy and dignitary interests and the commoners mostly did not. And it, it it's sort of like the, the Europe and the rest of the world following it decided to level up 
And we decided to level down, right? We we tore the privileges of the elites down and um, and subjected public figures of various sorts to all sorts of scrutiny and um, and and contempt and complaints and and all of their private details are up for grabs. Um, and 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 yet the same is true for for us private individual commoners too. There are trade offs of both approaches, but I. I I, I prefer the U.S. system in part because we're one of the only places doing it. And so as a result, I, I don't think it's an accident that this is where Internet, you know, the Internet flourished because of our strong free speech culture. I think we're about to see another wave of, of similar technologies that are based in AI. And when we do, I think that, you know, Europe, they will be so... The, the advances will be so important to knowledge and society in every possible way that um, that Europe will still adopt them and then we'll just complain and they'll kind of back into some interpretation of the GDPR that allows them to still make use of our products. And so I, you know, I just hope we don't mess this up by um, by following suit and um, and and trying to, you know, trying to conform to the privacy standards of the rest of the world. And I think it's interesting. So the GDPR and, and these frameworks oftentimes do look at the end use of um, PII in determining how it should be regulated or whether it should be regulated. And um, one of the things I found interesting here, almost the reverse, Jane, of what you were saying is that Clearview has stood up and, and offered to actually um, limit the use of its services solely to government entities. So you know, essentially solely to law enforcement and, and other non-public entities. So, you know, what, what's your thinking there? I mean, you were saying if it, if it were the opposite, um, you know, this, this, you know, we might not be here, but what do you think of the fact that Clearview has taken it, you know, essentially flipped your position on its head? Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of first, the first amendment, they're less, you know, a single bill that constrains the police departments will end their business model. So, um, and, and there there would not be a First Amendment argument to be made. I, I think. I, I by the way, I'm, I'm you know I think that would be bad policy, but that's a whole other debate. It's not worth having it here in three minutes. <laughs> Beth, for their thoughts on that. I mean, I think I agree. I it obviously would depend on a bunch of different circumstances, but yes, you could imagine that essentially you apply state actor analysis to this and it becomes, to the extent that there's any speech involved, it becomes government speech. So there's no First Amendment question at all. Well, so I just, you know, I thought it was a final question to ask both of you to speak to, you know, how your work in the subject has impacted how you saw me. I was, you know, very interested in thinking about how third parties are sharing images of people. You know, how has your work in this area impacted the images that you share online and, and, you know, what you, the conversations that you have in your private lives about what, what you allow, we say allow, because obviously you can't stop anyone from, but you would prefer that others share about you. Just thinking down the road about, uh, you know, again, coming back to that question of what's really important here and, and how does it impact us in our daily lives? Yeah, I mean, I, I come from the background, I, growing up, I was really intensely interested in photography, especially street photography, and also in social sciences. <laughs> and so I have always been, you know, a consumer of other people's private data and information. And so I think that that has made me feel like I have to pay it forward. And and unless I know that there's a problem. So, so basically, the, answer, the short answer is that um, I don't really change my behavior. I could imagine some some um, implementation of facial recognition changing that, but right now I don't I don't see it, and I it, it doesn't really affect it how I how I live. Vera, me neither. I mean, I could have you know turned my camera off for this whole uh, conversation and not even let you guys into my home and see my face, and if you were using Clearview AI, capture my face print. Um, but no, I agree. I similarly don't really change the way that I behave, even though sometimes I think that's silly. But in part, that's also because I hope that our legal system will draw the right lines. Super. Thank you. Well, I, I might have gone and deleted all my kids' photographs. <laughs> In the social media platforms where I put them, you know, just thinking about, again, the choices that we make for ourselves, but, you know, I don't feel like I'm in a position to make a choice for them. So all of a sudden I was like, you know what, this is the world in which we live in. I'm going to, I'm going to 
backpedal on that one and make sure that they get to make that decision for themselves. So, so you know, very interesting. Thank you very much for your um, fielding my questions. And I'm sure we'll have many other interesting questions from the other attendees in the group. So I think um, Seth mentioned this at the beginning that each of you um, in, under the panel, you have like a little hand that you can raise um, when you have a question. So I'm hoping that I can look and see when those hands go up. But of course, um, if anyone sees anyone with a question or a hand up, um, please let me know and we'll get Lisa to unmute them. I do want to just also add in, it looks like we have a couple people who joined us tonight just by using the dial in. Um, if you press star three, if you have just dialed in, you can essentially raise your hand by pressing star three, and that will let me know you have a question. Okay, it looks like we have one from Frederick Lane. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Frederick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? We can. Excellent. So this has been a fascinating discussion, and I'd really like to thank you for bringing all of these issues up. Um, just real quick background. I'm an attorney and also an author. I've written uh, 10 books now, one of which was on the history of American privacy and a bunch recently that deal with what I refer to as the cyber traps of modern living, the risks of using digital devices. So this whole conversation is, is really up my alley. I think my response to the discussion is that my concern is that what this is representing is the corporatization of the concept of speech. And I'm particularly concerned about the aspect of Clearview taking these images that it harvests and running a separate process on them that generates new information and then using that information without the consent of the people from whom that information is derived. And my, my thought with respect to this is that when we talk about Shutterstock or Google Photos, which I use constantly, there are at least terms and conditions, which admittedly most of us haven't read, that indicate that we give those services permission to do that. I want a version of the First Amendment that recognizes somewhat in the way that Brandeis and Holmes did back in 1890, you know, that there's a right to your image and control over that image as part of a right to privacy. And I would find it difficult to accept the idea that the First Amendment gives a corporation a speech right to publicize something derived from my image. And I understand, because I lecture about this constantly, that people need to be realistic about what they put out in the world on social media, absolutely. But I don't want us to abandon the idea, at least nominally in law, that we are still entitled to control how that information is used. Um, so there's that piece of it. The one other thing I'd throw in is that in the analysis of the kinds of things we're doing here, the volume and scale seems to me to matter. So yes, I agree with the wet brain AI <laughs> comparison, this idea that when we look at photos on social media or we see people walking down the street, we are doing an organic version of face mapping to recognize individuals, but it's on a very small scale. And I do think that there are significant social slash legal implications of allowing a corporation to do this for hundreds of millions of photos. And there is a point I think at which the, the sheer capability of a corporation changes the calculus with respect to speech and privacy. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on those points. Thanks. Well, I mean, those concerns sound like part of uh, part of what could be raised when justifying a um, you know a, a speech restriction. But would they, you know, would those concerns, vague as they are, about scale and risk? you know, sort of in the abstract, would those meet the, the requirements of, of scrutiny? I, I don't think so. 
uh, it, it, you know, so the scale point was made also when the popular internet, you know, the sort of um, web browser enabled internet um, came about. It did change the way we speak. It did have harms. I mean, the, the fact that, um, uh, you know, we're, we're still figuring out the repercussions of, of social media. Um, it is a risk. Uh, and we don't have enough information at the outset, I think, to satisfy free speech scrutiny. But that's just a known problem in this uh, in this decision that every country has to make about whether to fear the risks of the unknown more or the risks from stasis. Um, and you know, I, the, the the courts, I think, have, have have made that determination, and I and I think they've made it wisely. And the one thing I think the scale point is interesting because it makes me wonder if actually it supports the idea that there's something different going on when there's reliance on a face print rather than just human beings identifying each other in public. I do think those two things are different. I haven't thought about it necessarily in terms of scale, but it, to me, there is a difference between being able to, as a human, identify someone in public who I happen to know and scouring across time and locations and different media to identify the same individual. Um, and I think perhaps that has to do with what a face print is, as opposed to what just recognizing another person's face is. Um, and I actually, perhaps to go to my free speech side um, of my brain, I think the idea of the right to an image or the right to control information about yourself is too, it, that makes me worried and it's too broad, I think. Um, and it does feel to me different than what is going on here, which is about the protection of one's privacy and security in a biometric identifier, um, which again, to me is like a, go ahead, sorry. I apologize, um, if I may, Vera. I think that was precisely the point I was trying to get at in that, um, from my understanding of what Clearview does, it runs this algorithmic process on the face prints on the, to create a face map of an individual. And then it's taking that face map and using it for subsequent applications. Right, I think that's right. So it's taking right. public photographs, extracting, face prints and then using those right. face prints to and that's that, search engine. Right. And it seems to me, and I'd love to have you address this and then then I'll bail out, but but it seems to me that that even if you consider Clearview's use of those face maps as speech, and I'm not saying you do per se, but even if one were to do so, it seems to me that there's an intervening event that has legal significance which is the generation of that face map from data for which you did not explicitly receive consent. So. I very much agree. That's essentially the theory of our case. Excellent. Uh, and so do I, I just, I just think that that's a distinction that makes no difference. Um, you know, if, if, so by, by that logic, creating, you know, creating a photograph from something, you know, from something that's either happening in public or that, or even taking a picture of a picture or something, that too is the creation of new data. Or if you want to go the analysis way, um, you know, sort um, you know, scanning, scanning an image or an analyzing it for any number of features, not necessarily for the purpose of identification, that is the generation, yes, of new information, but it just, it's not something that should require consent or or rather if it does require consent, we need a pretty good reason to to put that burden on, on those who are doing it. it. If I may, Jane, it seems to me that under New York law, um, if, if you take a photo in public place that has an identifiable image, you could post that to social media but you can't commercialize that image without consent. 
So I think to, I may have understood, misunderstood what was happening. So first of all, I think, again, I really do, for me, the argument is really limited to biometric identifiers, and it's not about the creation of new information. Perhaps it's actually about the capture of existing immutable information. I think there's a serious difference between reposting someone's photograph, taking a screenshot of someone's image, certainly recording police abuses in public, and extracting biometric identifiers from any of those images. This goes back to a point of disagreement, but to me, the difference between a photograph and a face print. On the commercial point, I think that's interesting, and I wonder what others on this call who are um, probably many media lawyers are here. I, I'm interested in what they think about that, but to, the thing I always think about when we start to think about the infusion of money into any of these conversations and, oh, doesn't that change our intuitions, is newspapers. So is the question, is this commercial misappropriation? Frederick, was that That's what it sounded like to me. Uh, yes. Um, has, I apologize. But yes, that, that's what was driving the idea that, you know, these individuals, Clearview is uh, monetizing the face maps that they create from images that people have posted online. I saw a comment from Lynn Oberlander. Do you want to jump in? She didn't raise her hand, but. You're calling on her. I'm calling on her. Well, well, she's maybe joining. Can I just follow up on the th the thread that you all were talking about, which is maybe to put a question, I think to probably to both of you, but J Jane and Vera, but especially to Vera. If let's say hypothetically there was like a riot at the Capitol and there were a whole bunch of people that were escorted out, but we didn't know who they were. And let's assume that a, a news organization like, let's say Reuters, um, has a huge database of photographs from its prior publications. Right. And it sent a team of reporters to sit down and look at the photographs to see if they could identify who was involved in the riot. I think you would say that's there's nothing problematic about that so far. Right. That's a question for Vera. I think that I'm sorry, I was starting to think about what my answer would be, and I've missed the very end of your hypo. So I'm sorry. Or just, your that a team of journalists went to, you know, basically looked at the the, um, you know, went through the database of Reuters went through, you know, sort of pictures that were posted of the riot and tried to figure out who these people were. That would be no, okay. Nothing. Yes, right? correct. And so if they then had a computer program that aided them in doing that, would that then violate HIPAA in your view? If it created, so it depends on what the computer program does exactly. I think there's, okay. you know, potentially you could say like, let's match everyone by their, the length of their hair, or let's match if people have glasses or whatever else, which I think isn't the same necessarily as capturing a Face print, but I think once you get to a point of capturing a face print, then yes, it would violate BIPA. And then I think there's a separate question where I think probably I land on it does have to, it does satisfy the First Amendment to regulate this without consent. But I do think there's still a separate question of whether O'Brien scrutiny as applied to that instance is satisfied. But the technology doesn't exist. I mean, so, so. So my problem with that, first of all, is that I just don't think that a face print is actually different from comparing lengths of hair, because once once you're talking about, OK, well, it's this length of hair and glasses and you get enough features that so that you have confidence that you're getting a unique signature. Well, then we're talking about a face print. Right. So. Um, uh, but but, you know, we won't get good at facial recognition if most uses are illegal. Um, and. If only a few uses, if, if, you know, when we let our imagination run wild and we think about which uses are actually commercially viable and likely to be used at scale, if there are only a few of them compared to the broad set of uses that might seem very good for journalists and everyone else, um, then that should be a sign that, you know, we need to either you know, you know that, that that we need to to craft the law to to be much more narrow. That it's not just face prints per se that are the problem. It's how they're they're being used. I you know I just think that claiming that the face print is meaningfully different so that it gets out of scrutiny is the wrong thing here. What 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 you what you're really what what seems to be motivating, um, you know, both um, both Vera and Frederick is the possible risks from 
from this kind of information and how it's going to be used. And that goes to the ultimate, you know, justification and tailoring question. That 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 that's com I'm comfortable talking about that, but only within an like, sort of acknowledgement that that we're we're doing it through traditional free speech scrutiny. Can I respond? I think one thing is that I think of I think we think of the harms differently too. So to me, there's actually a harm that is enacted when the biometric identifier is taken without someone's knowledge or consent, and it is because this broader expectation that it won't be extracted is violated and also the security harm. It feels to me very similar to a just hoard of people's house keys. Even if you don't use them to go into their homes, I think there's a harm there. So so this is goes way broader than the house keys because this, this is not closely related at all. Facebook is not closely related at all to how data security is working. So even the even the phones that open up with your face, they have liveness detection. It is much more than just a face print. Um, but, but the bigger response, I think, is that's exactly what people said when the brownie camera was invented. That's exactly what Warren and Brandeis said when the brownie camera was invented. That, hey, you can't take my photograph and use it for whatever purposes you want without my consent. That's my image. So I just don't see how this is how this is different except for saying unless we rely on sort of like okay we have the right amount of exposure <laughs> to each other and no more and and that i know that's not what you're saying but i just have not heard a convincing difference distinction i'm sorry to jump in i just wanted to flag we also have a question from dave schultz i didn't if you want to say more i didn't mean to we could go on but let's see if we could get dave in there and and we had Lynn in here too, was trying to jump in, but I I wasn't able to unmute her, so someone would need to. Oh, Lynn, are you? Her as well. hey, can you hear me? This is Dave. And can I, I jump in? The, the question I had is really related to this, and maybe maybe it's not the same point because I think the the first person who I didn't catch really was getting at it, and and I had a question for Jane, and I guess we just things differently, but I didn't. It does seem to me that where this gets hung up is whether your analogy to DNA doesn't really map on to, to the argument you're making that, you know, you leave DNA behind everywhere you go, and that doesn't mean someone can take it and sequence it and then use that. And that the way Vera is framing it is really, it's not a speech right, it's a news, it's like, it's like a news gathering issue. Like, do you have a right to gather information about a person's face by using an algorithm that creates a unique identifier that is unique to that person the same way their DNA is. And 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 then the use the use issues also get into a whole different set of questions, which the, the, the prior question was trying to get at. But you know, you mentioned Brandeis and Holmes, right? They said you can't use a brownie camera, but laws all over this country now say, well, you can't use a brownie camera to take a picture and commercialize it. And so you know, it's called commercial misappropriation. You can't use someone's image for purposes of trade. In New York State, that means you can't put them in an advertisement. You can't put them on your cereal box. Um, but the question is, what's a use for trade? But you can put it inside a book. You can put yeah. it inside a book. Yes, or yes, yes. A but, 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 it's, but it's clear water. Putting it in a book? No, they're 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 monetizing no. it. This is no, a, they're yeah. monetizing it. The, they're monetizing it the way a newspaper monetizes the photographs that are in their print. No, well, they're, they're not. They're not. They're not advertising. Hey, get our service, and they're not putting your face map on their on their advertisement. This is this is different. I think this is quite distinguishable from the yeah. fairly narrow protections of commercial misappropriation. Okay, but, but what huh? about what about the DNA analysis? DNA. Yeah. Why well, is so, it a unique identifier? Well, because so the DNA protection, the laws prohibiting DNA, DNA sequencing are attempting to not are attempting to prevent each other from knowing the um the the um sorry the um phenotype of of people right so this is the, and the health you know the the um the health of someone and the, their their biology this is this is much more um intensive invasive and and specific information than dna as identification now if there was a law that said um so put it this way i think it's a harder case for me if it was really um, if 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 someone was 
if a company was trying to use DNA, just the junk part of DNA, just for the purposes of identifying who goes where, then I think the analogy to facial recognition, then I get it. I, I think that that is on all fours. But um, but the laws, at least that I'm familiar with, that prohibit DNA sequencing are doing it kind of for the same reason that the federal government has already banned genetic discrimination. Um, and, and actually on that point, I, I, I will say, I, I really think we, sh I would love to use discrimination law or anti-discrimination law to modernize that as a way to accomplish most of, most of the policy goals that I suspect Vera and I and, and, and many of us actually share. Um, because anti-discrimination gets to the use, you know, how a certain piece of information is actually going to be used to um, to affect that the subject of the of, of the data's um, actual rights or you know act, their their life in some way. Um, and anti-discrimination law, we we have a lot more latitude for saying, okay, you can know you can know what you want to know about this person, but you can't use it in order to treat them in in some differential way. Um, there, you know, I, I would be comfortable arguing with Vera that that those laws would be um, conduct regulations. Um, and so, so I, you know, th th there's a lot more room to maneuver here without basically making illegal a whole wide swath of of information based services. Right. I know that that Lynn had a comment earlier. I'm going to give her a chance to jump in here. Oh, OK. So yeah. actually, I was going to um, ask about the DNA, but I'll, I'll ask a separate question now, um, which is that is Clearview also arguing? I mean, let's just I mean, part of it, this is a fascinating discussion. Let me just say, and I'm really, really excited to be here and to listen to you all. It is really terrific. Um, but. The, it does feel a little bit like you are both. You're very close, right? Strict scrutiny versus intermediate scrutiny, and 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 yet you're not really getting to the real creepiness of what Clearview was doing, which in the end of the day is may end up driving the decision of some court one way or the other because it's incredibly creepy. Um, and this is a set as a staunch advocate of the First Amendment and of the rights to take pictures of people in public and of all of that. So. My other question, this uh, this just occurred to me when uh, James was speaking, is it's clear to you also arguing that it owns the biometric print that it has created using its own algorithm? So is it ultimately sort of owning the biometric information of any individual using its its algorithm? Is it is it taking it that way? Much like, you know, I guess patenting DNA and, you know, patenting life forms can be these days. Or are they not making that? No, argument? I don't think I don't think that that's come up. on the table. Okay. Yeah. I don't believe that's come up, but I want I actually don't know what inf intellectual property protections they're per claiming in their algorithm. But I wonder if that is, you know, that would help answer the question. Floyd may also be here, so he might be able to yeah. best answer that question. That's true. Do we have have Floyd and one? Floyd, would you like to jump in? Let's see if I can find you. On our list. Well, while we're, we're pressing, you know, I, I, I. Oh, sorry. I don't believe Floyd is on it. Oh, okay. Point. I mean, I, I agree, though, that we are we are not talking about the creepiness factor, but I think that's in part because it is a, well, at least I, I see that as a um, a real liability in terms of the Illinois law that it is just it, it sweeps much broader than this particular case um and even on on the even on the facts of this case um d you know is is creepiness enough to outweigh the benefits of solving cold cases or un unsolved crimes or for identifying you know the capital protesters or um or even identifying, um, you know, f finding where uh, uh, or identifying people with outstanding uh, warrants. I, I know that th this is raising some of the Fourth Amendment kind of, you know, policing um, criminal justice issues. Um, but there are good arguments on both sides of that question. And there's at least I would say that there's not a clear slam dunk answer 
that um, that this use is illegitimate. Uh, and so even in intermediate scrutiny, but certainly with strict scrutiny, I don't think that the creepiness is 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 going to should, should 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 be enough. So I think where I would have started is exactly where Jane ended, which is I think the reason we we didn't actually end up talking about how we think the tailoring analysis plays out. We spent more time talking about which part applies, but I think that's where the creepiness would have come in um, more directly. And to me, I think actually all of the things that make us feel uncomfortable about Clearview are things that show why there is a serious government interest in this and you know i i guess i did actually talk about the tailoring piece in terms of the problem being lack of knowledge and control and the solution being notice and consent um but i think that the creepiness is important for the tailoring analysis and i think just actually as just an interesting aside since we're talking about dna and since jane raised um, government use. I, an interesting piece, some of the things that this connects to in my work on the Fourth Amendment side is actually the government does collect our unavoidably shed DNA without a warrant and argues that it can sequence that DNA for the quote unquote junk STRs um, in order to identify people all without a warrant. And that's something we're pushing back on on the privacy side. And one of the questions that came in um, just to the panelists was um, about the, the bun, you know, saying, you know, how does it apply? So to clarify, it does require notice and consent of the individuals. So I, I think, Vera, you said this earlier, it's not that this is a prohibition, this is the way the law is structured right now, is that it would require each of the individual subjects to be notified of their image being part of this database and being and consent to its use. So I hope that answered the question. So I think we're coming through. I mean, Aaron and Jana, you know, thank you very much. I want to give you another opportunity um, to come back to any final thoughts or or points about you know, you know, again, what you think is most important here. Or any you know takeaways that you'd like us to have from this conversation? I I think I've said enough. <laughs> it, it is it is a fascinating case. I. You know, I, it, it's been a pleasure to to hear Vera. Um, I obviously I've read the the briefs, but it, it's really nice to 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 see you in person as well. Uh, same here. I, I learned. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, same here. I also learned a lot from this conversation, and I um, you know thank you all for listening to us and Jane for sharing your thoughts. I learned a lot also from your article and from your brief. I think you know you make very interesting and in some cases difficult for me to respond to points, um, but I hope that makes all of the work better. I think as Catherine flagged in the beginning, there will likely be a decision in this particular case in August, so folks should look out for that. Um, and I think that the one last thing that I think is interesting here, and maybe this is a thing I get to say because I'm lucky enough to be an ACLU lawyer, but sometimes I think it's helpful to start with our intuitions of what world we want to see and then work to the law that actually enables that. Um, and that is, I will admit, partially how I thought about this case. So folks who are starting from the creepiness factor, I am there with you. Uh, just before uh, Seth signs off, I'd like to thank all three of you, Jane, Catherine, and Vera, uh, for this incredible discussion. Just imagine what a law school classroom would be like teaching the First Amendment if this video were presented to them. Um, what a wonderful uh, experience in terms of opening up people's minds when it comes to the First Amendment. So um, these, uh, this will is recorded. It will be posted uh, on the First Amendment Salon's website. And I hope uh, educators and lawyers and others uh, see the value in it as all of us did. And again, I thank all three of you. And Seth, I turn it over to you to close. I'll just echo Ron's thanks. That was a tremendous discussion. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to the three of you for leading it and to all of our guests for joining us. Uh, and we'll look forward to having Reed back on the 13th of July for our next First Amendment Salon. Thanks very much and good night.